Welcome on part 2 of the tutorial about creating a waveform visualizer, an oscilloscope using uh, 3D shapes, NGGL multiple NGIT gen. So, in the previous video, we arrived to the point where we basically are using the amplitude from one single sample of my voice to scale this 3D cube. And now in this video, we're going to use GIT gen to do the same, but with a lot more objects. So let me delete a couple of things. I will delete these GTFPS GUI objects. I'm going to delete also all these uh, JIT matrix and stuff that we did in the previous video. Cool, I'm just going to remain with my GGL material, my GGL grid shape. We don't even need this trigger actually, because we are just going to bang this JIT catch. And cool. Now let's create a matrix that has three planes, is of type Flow32 as a dimension 100. So it's basically the same type and dimension as the matrix that comes out from the JIT catch, but as three planes. So the three planes of this matrix are all going to be filled with the same uh, uh, value, with a single value from uh, the single plane of the input matrix. But it's useful for us to have three planes because when we're going to use the GGL multiple, we want to provide three numbers to the position attribute. So we need to have three planes. So let's see how this works in practice. Let's create a JIT gen. Connect this here. And uh, let's create then a GGL multiple object that renders to my cooled world. And this will have, for the moment, two GL params, okay? So we need to write two, that's the number of GL parameters, so of attributes that we are modifying for the target shape. Then we need to give it the attribute GL params, and we need to say which parameters we are going to modify. So we're going to modify the position of the target object and the scale of the target object. So the GGL multiple object is a bit dumb, right? Because it first needs to know how many parameters we are going to modify, which also determines how many input this object has. And then it also needs to know which parameters we are going to modify. And we are going to modify the position and the scale. You are probably thinking, uh, could it not be enough to write which uh, parameters we are going to modify and then it will automatically create as many inputs? Probably yes, but that's not how it works. It works like this. You first need to tell him how many parameters you are going to modify and then which one those are. So cool, our target is going to be our GGL grid shape. So I just connect it here. You can see that the shape disappears from the scene. It's not because it's not being rendered anymore. It's being rendered, but uh, the scale attribute is set to zero. That's why it doesn't work. Also, we want to give to this GGL grid shape the automatic zero attribute. This means that this shape is not going to be rendered anymore just by itself, but it's going to be rendered only by the GGL multiple. So this is something nice that we want to have. So let's connect now the first output of the GGN object to the first input of the GGL multiple. And this will be where we decide our position. Now I go inside JITGen. And I'm going to create, I'm going to delete this plus operator, I'm going to create the S norm object. Now the S norm object is an object that contains the signed normalized coordinates between minus one and one. And if you don't know what this object does, I made a series of tutorials about JITGen, which is called JITGen from zero to hero. And this is actually the first object that I covered there. But basically, for every cell of the input matrix, it creates coordinates between minus 1 and 1. So it will just remap the integer coordinates of the input matrix from 0 to 99 between minus 1 and 1. So that's pretty great because we want to use these as the x coordinate for the position of our 3D objects. So I'm going to create a vector object. And again, if you don't know what a vector object is, just check the relative tutorial in uh, my series. So this is going to be the X coordinate for our shapes that go between minus one to one. Now, as you can see, it should already render them, but they are not appearing in our window. Well, they actually being rendered, but they are simply uh, too small. They, the scale is set to zero by default because we are not giving it any value. So from within the JIT gen, we create a second output. We create a second vector object and we're going to say that the scale is going to be 0.1 for the x, the y and the z axis. Cool. 
So now we close the JGen, we connect the second output that we just created to the scale input. And there we go. These are our shapes. The thing is that they are 100 shapes and they are a bit too clumped together. So we probably want to modify these, uh, the X coordinate a bit. So we could, for example, just multiply this value by two. So in fact, enlarging the range between minus two and two. Or we could also set them to a smaller scale for the X and the zeta. The Y, we can leave it as it is. So 0.05. Okay, this is still too big. Let's just try 0.01. All right, so these are our shapes now. Um, cool, this is a bit too small, so let's say maybe 0.02 for the X. Okay, this seems about right. And for the Zeta, we can also keep it at 0.02. Or maybe for the Zeta, we can even uh, leave them at 0.1. Okay, cool. So now we can see that those shapes are slightly separated from each other. Let's actually give them a slightly smaller scale, like 18. Cool. So now we got that our shapes are all scaled on the x-axis of 0.018, on the y 0.1, and on the z at 0.1. So, cool. Now, what we want to do is to use the value for, from our um, JITCATCH object, so the amplitude of the audio buffer samples, as the y scale for these uh, objects. So I'm simply going to go like this, I'm going to switch uh, the first plane of the input matrix, which anyway, the three planes are all the same, right? They all filled with the same values we said. So I'm going to switch just the first one, just to take one, and I'm going to use it as the scale value for the Y. And you can see that it's actually already working. We are visualizing the waveform through those shapes uh, using the amplitude of the audio buffer that we are getting from my voice. So that's pretty cool. So as we did in the previous video, I'm going to simply add a buffer to this. So the Y scale is always going to be at a minimum uh, 0.08 or something like that. Exactly. And uh, so, or maybe something even smaller, 0.2. Exactly. So it's never going to go below 0.02. And uh, every time I speak, uh, it's going to follow the amplitude of the frame buffer because every cell from the input matrix is going to modify one cell of the output matrix and every cell in this JIT matrix input is going to be represented as a three-dimensional shape by the GGL multiple. So we have one shape for every cell of the input matrix. Cool. Uh, let's multiply this amplitude for something bigger. So we got a, a bigger waveform. Okay, this seems pretty good. Um, now, uh, it's a bit too fast changing, it's changing a bit too fast, so I'm going to use one object that I love to use, which is called the JIT slide object, which simply does interpolation between subsequent matrices that it receives. So it takes a couple of attributes, slide down, slide down, let's say 10, and then slide up. So this means how much time it takes to to interpolate when the numbers go down and how many matrices it takes to interpolate when they go up. So I'm simply going to put this between the second input of the GGL multiple and the second output of the JITGEN. Cool. So now we can see that it's going, uh, like, uh, it's going slowly up and slowly down. If we want that it just goes slowly down but fast up, we could say slide up too, and then it will take some time before it goes down. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now, one other thing that we could do is to change also the color of those shapes, right? Because they are now all the same color, all red, but we could, for example, modify also their color, modifying another attribute from the GGL multiple. So I will write three instead of two, which means we are going to modify another attribute, which is color. So I also have to specify which attribute. Cool. And I'm simply going to use the JIT noise with four planes, type float 32, and 100 cells. Now, why four planes? Because we need as many planes as are the arguments of the attribute we are going to modify. Now, the color, we say, takes four parameters, red, green, and blue, and alpha, four arguments to this attribute. So every plane of the input matrix is going to be transformed in an um, argument for that attribute. So in this case, 
the four planes are going to fill the red, green, blue and the alpha values. So now we get that every shape has a different color because they just get some random uh, values from the JIT noise as the color attribute. Okay, so this seems pretty cool. Uh, let's try to change a bit the color, the background color. Yeah, something like this dark green works pretty nicely. So cool. Congratulations, you managed to finish this tutorial. So I hope everything was clear. If it was not clear, ask me in the comments, check my previous videos. Um, check my Patreon to download the patch and to get access to a lot of other patches and the content about Jitter in Max. And in any case, see you soon in the next video. Ciao!